It is. Okay, all right. So, so the talk, uh, the title of this presentation is Asian Religion as Method in the Mountains, a Zomian Himalayan Perspective. So another M, method. So we had so many M's and I know that as we were discussing this, uh, uh, this seminar series, we kept on adding more and more M's. Well, so today this is uh, how my presentation is going to be organized. First of all, I'm going to be talking about uh, the present moment and how I see, um, uh, you know, how, what, what is it in the current present moment that leads me to think about this question of Asian religion as method and, and what is its significance and importance. And the second part is going to be really to look at how can we refocus the discussion, discussion on religion into an Asian and inter-Asian approach. And the third is, well, that Asian or inter-Asian approach leads us to think of other conceptions of religions than the dominant um, secular Western conception of religion that dominates the academic discourse. Um, and that leads me to thinking a little bit deeper into some of the ontologies and practices of Asian religions, which relate to different modes of relating uh, to different types of entities in the world and the, in, and the universe. And finally, um, my thinking and my talk will, will reach um, uh, Northeast India in the framing of Zomia in the Himalayan region and thinking about, right, thinking up and down the mountains. So, to begin with, um, I mean, we're living in special times and um, many of us are in fact in this kind of forced retreat in a kind of a forced meditation because of different types of lockdowns and all of the restrictions on our social life, uh, which are caused by the pandemic. So in a sense, much of our life has been um, to some degrees in pause um, and um, uh, and many parts of our economic and social life, in fact, are being torn uh, through all the hardships um, and the suffering uh, of many people who have been uh, hit by the COVID-19 uh, and their uh, dear ones, their families, uh, their friends. And so we're in a, in a time where, where, in effect, we find ourselves as humans in many ways, to some degrees, somewhat helpless. And this also happens at a time when so many, other, so many others of the structures that seem to um, order our world are being torn apart or falling apart, whether it's in, within our own country or region with different groups, uh, the tensions and conflicts between different groups uh, on the rise or whether the political systems seem to be uh, increasingly dysfunctional, or even whether the international order itself um, doesn't seem to be functioning uh, very well anymore. And so when we see all of this, I really like the Indian conception of Leela. And so we might think, you know, this is, what is this in the divine play, the way the, or the world is being churned up um, and we're caught up in all of these transformations. And so I just want to think about that a little bit more about the notion of, of Leela, the notion of play, as, as I understand it in a very, taking this notion to start thinking in a very perhaps superficial way. But we think then in, in you know, the games that we play, I'm an anthropologist and in anthropology and in sociology, our social life is very much conceived of as in a sense, as um, a play, we talk about the roles that we play in social life, you know, the roles that we might play as father, as wife, as son, as daughter, as teacher, as students, as worker. So we're all playing roles in, in the different aspects of our life. There's in sociological theories, for example, there's the front stage and there's the backstage. So in a sense, all our life is, in, is playing a game or playing different games in our life. And some of these games um, are destructive. Um, and some of the games, when we played them for a very long time, um, at a certain age, they might have been appropriate. But then as we grow and grow up and we have more capacities, more capacity to, to harm each other, some of these games become destructive. So there are destructive games, but also there are constructive games too. And so I think now we're in a time 
when a lot of the old games, according to which our world, our lives have been organized, some of these games are falling apart. And we've got to learn to figure out what are the new games or what is the new way to play. And I don't think we know. And so this is really the, an important turning point that humanity is finding itself in. And so I think that when I'm talking today, I'm not gonna be proposing some kind of set methodology or some kind of set theory, but really what I'm gonna be talking about when I talk about Asian religion as method is how can we find within Asian religions um, some ideas and ways of thinking that can help us as we together try to find out what is the new type of game? What is the new type of play that we can play together as human beings in our world? And we're in a time when whether it's the modern types of games or the ancient types of games, none of them are really functioning. And so I'm not suggesting that we should revive some ancient traditions, but what I'm going to be suggesting is how can we delve into our different uh, spiritual traditions, our religious traditions in Asia, and what kinds of methods of thinking, what kinds of methods of doing might help us as we try to construct, as we try to design uh, new mindsets, um, new mental operating systems, new ways of functioning in our society. And this is something that has no easy answer, and I'm certainly not going to be suggesting any answers today. But this is kind of in the, this is the direction of the talk that I'm going to be given today, giving today. It's kind of the direction of my thinking. Um, and so when we have, um, let me see, what's, what's my slide saying here? Right, as we try to find and to create new games, so then we need um, any new game, let's say any new sport, any new practice, there are methods involved. We need to learn how. So this is one, as, one way that I'm understanding the, the notion of method here. And I'm also thinking that um, in the past, we learned how to play together in villages, right? We learned how to play together in small mountain communities. We learn how to play together in cities, but really we're still tr struggling to learn how to play together in highly diverse, multicultural and multi-religious environments uh, within one country and even within the whole world. And yet that's what we have to learn. We have to learn how to play together. And if we learn how to play together, we'll be united and we'll be happy. And so I think that's, uh, that's the spirit in which I propose to look at Asian religion as method. So an inter-Asian approach. Now, the first thing, as I suggest this is, well, one might be wondering, I mean, who am I to speak about Asia? Um, I'm not born in Asia. I'm not racially Asian. Um, and so it actually might be a little presumptuous for me to have anything to say about this topic. Um, and even within Asia, I'm a specialist on Chinese religion and society, and I have no expertise whatsoever on any other uh, Asian society or culture. So I really should say that I come here um, uh, in a learning mode. And um, I don't come here to present what is uh, Asian religion um, uh, and to, right, you know, I, I, uh, so, and, and I, I, I come here as somebody who's been trying to be in this learning mode for many years. So I'm a migrant to Asia. So I know that many Asians migrate to other countries and to my own home, uh, home country of Canada, but I've migrated the other way. Uh, I first came to Asia, actually to Pakistan in the late 1980s. And then I spent much of the, much of the 1990s uh, in Asia, in China, and all of the year, the, in, the, in the past, uh, uh, much of the past two decades also. So I've really moved here and my life is here and my future is here in Asia. So I speak as somebody who's migrated, fallen in love with Asia and is still learning as a lifelong, as a lifelong endeavor. And of course, uh, whether it's talking about Asia in general, or whether it's talking about one particular, um, 
one particular country in Asia, especially as I cross over now, speaking, for example, about India or two Indians, and um, uh, we'll always encounter different types of stereotypes. And uh, that's something I want to talk about when, we talk, when I'm talking about inter-Asian conversations. It's very interesting because, um, um, so I live in Hong Kong and I've previously lived in mainland China. And this is um, regions that are often considered to be not so religious. And then we have this stereotype about India that it's very, very religious. So that's the kind of a stereotype we have. But of course our stereotypes can be wrong. It's funny when I've, I've been to India just a few times, uh, three times to be exact. And I had this impression that in India, there are sacred cows walking all over the place in the cities. And to be honest, where I live in Hong Kong, would you believe it? Believe it or not, there are feral cows who wander around the streets in my village, wild cows. And I have to say that when I went to India, I didn't see that many cows in the streets of um, Calcutta or Chennai. And I see more cows in the streets of the, no the new territories of Hong Kong where I live. So that's one stereotype. Uh, and another one, um, I thought that when I went to India, I thought there would be temples all over the place. Um, but when I've been to India, well, I did see a lot of temples. But actually, if you go to a place which is replete with Chinese culture, such as Taiwan, and even, again, Hong Kong, I'd say that there are actually just as many, the, the kind of the, the density or the number of temples is pretty much very comparable. And of course, in mainland China, it's different. Um, but if you go to some of the rural areas in the countryside, um, one would be surprised. So, so an inter-Asian conversation is one where I think it's interesting, it would be interesting to look at, um, to confront and compare our different religious cultures and to do so without taking the Western conception of religion as our standard. Um, one of the, um, um, another thing that I realized when I, uh, when I visited India was that, in fact, on the one hand, Chinese temples and Indian Hindu temples, in many ways, they're very comparable because they are all very localized. They're not part of a big, uh, you know, a big organization. And they have many gods and deities uh, enshrined inside the temple. And so in many ways, and the way and what people pray for, you know, they pray for happiness and prosperity. They pray for health. Uh, they pray for business. They pay, pray for exams. And they also pray for transcendental uh, motivations too. But in many ways, I think that there's very, very comparable. But there was one thing that I saw that was different is that if you go to a Chinese temple, um, it's wide in a sense one can walk in and then immediately the, the gods are wide open. You can go directly to the gods and pray to them. There's no priest. Um, but uh, when you go to an Indian temple, uh, there's a very, very narrow passage. So in a sense, the access to the god is limited. And then there is um, a priest uh, who is there standing beside the God. And in a sense, we receive the blessing from the priest. So it's very interesting. Um, in one place, the access to the God is actually um, um, more, um, uh, it's harder to access the God. And there's that mediation of the priest to access the God. And in the Chinese side, one can directly go and access the God. And it's quite interesting because uh, China was defined as a country that has no religion by Western scholars and Chinese intellectuals who are influenced by Western scholars. And one of the reasons was that when you go into the Chinese temple, you won't see a priest. Of course, there are priests, but they aren't standing there and controlling or playing a dominant role in that act of worship. So it's really for that reason um, 
that Chinese religion was defined until recently uh, as not a religion at all, even though there are so many temples, so many gods, and so on. So an inter-Asian connection, an inter-Asian conversation, I think would be very interesting. One that is not mediated or not fully mediated by Western uh, secular conceptions of religion. But when I talk about Asian religion as method, of course, then one might ask the question, well, what is Asia anyway? And I don't want to give a definition. Um, I'm speaking of a region that has no, in fact, that has no clear borders that you can look at with different centers and from different perspectives that one could even consider Europe itself to be an extension a peninsula at the Western extension of Asia. And so I deliberately want to leave the notion of Asia undefined. And when I talk about Asian religion as method, I really, I'm taking direct inspiration from um, the Taiwanese scholar, um, uh, Chen Guangxing, uh, who wrote a book, Asia as Method Toward Deimperialization. And he was inspired by a lecture given by the Japanese scholar, Takeuchi Yoshimi in 1960, where he talked about Asia as method. And basically what the idea is, in a sense, in a post-colonial um, uh, in a post-colonial context or a context of post-colonial theory is how to find new frames of reference that are not the Western frame of reference. So multiplying our frames of reference and our subjectivity and worldview through the histories and cultures of Asian societies, albeit acknowledging the West as constitutive of Asian subjectivity. But the thing that I found though in many of these um, post-colonial discourses is that they tend to be still within a very secularist um, mode. And most of the post-colonial discourses have not, at least in my, um, uh, at least in my experience, uh, have not really directly and seriously engaged with the ontologies um, that exist, with the ontologies and practices, the cosmologies that are deeply prevalent within Asian societies and cultures. And so in a sense, when I talk about Asian religion as method, I want to build on the notion of Asian Asia as method, but I want to say, well, wait a minute here. If you wanna look at, take Asia as method, you have to deal with what we call religion, with the religious underpinnings of these Asian subjectivities, worldviews, cosmologies, and ontologies. Um, but I mean, what is Asian religion then? Well, again, I want to leave this, I don't want to define this. So the point of talking about Asian religion as method is to shift the center of gravity of our reference points. It's interesting that whether we're in China or India or Indonesia or other Asian countries, no matter where we are, it seems that the West is always the reference point. So Chinese people are always talking about China and the West. Indian people are always talking about India and the West. Uh, you know, J Japanese people are always talking about Japan and the West. So everybody has a common reference point, which is the West. So can we uh, kind of, un can we remove that the West as the central reference point? So this is the question I want to ask. But then also it's very important for me, why would I define it as Asian religion as method and not as let's say Chinese religion as method? Because you could do exactly the same thing. You could say, well, let's use Chinese ontologies and cosmologies or Indian ontologies and cosmologies. And one certainly could do that. But then when enters into a highly nation centered, nation state centered uh, mindset. And so in fact, what's so interesting about the notion of Asia is that it has no national or civilizational center. So Asia itself is decentered, and that allows us to decenter our own mental uh, operating systems, um, and to uh, it forces us to always look at to place ourselves in different positions. Um, so this is an important point that I want to make about. About Asia, and in a minute, at toward the end of my talk, I'll talk 
There is some problem with the audio. There's some problem with the audio. Can someone fix it? Uh, Peter, uh, if you could ask uh, David Parma to yes, disconnect I will, I will and connect again. Rejoin again. Sure, I'm, I'm doing it right away. Only he has to do that? Yes, if he yes. disconnect and connect, then he will come back. Okay, I think he is doing that. Father, so Subha, if you could just ask the audience to have patience and wait. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Doc. Please Dr. wait for a for yeah. a few. Hello, everybody. Please, please hold on for a for a few minutes. Yes. He's just coming in. Uh, there is an audio problem. Yes. Okay. Um, yes. All right. Good. We're back. Uh, my apologies to everybody. All right. So. Um... But your slides have gone. So. Uh... Yes. Please, please pull them back. And... Yes. All right. Are we okay? Yes, sir. Can you see yes. the slide? Okay. Yes, yes. Right. So, so I wanted to say that looking at, uh, to, to think about Asian religion, I include Christianity and Islam in this, um, in this broader uh, theme. Um, of course, I mean, that is simply a fact, since both of these religions have originated in Asia. But um, even more than that, though, um, you know, often we consider uh, Christianity to be a, a, a Western religion. And uh, Islam is, if not considered to be Western, but considered to be often far away over there in the Middle East. But we forget that the majority of Muslims in the world and a very large proportion of the Christians in the world actually live in Asia. And if we see then Asia as the center of Christianity and Islam, um, then we, it makes us rethink, you know, how do we understand these religions? Um, right, what about Indian Christianity? Islam in India, in Indonesia, uh, in Pakistan, in these countries that are more uh, farther east um, so how does that re how do we rethink these religions um, when we think of their uh, when we center them uh, in Asia? Um, and so as I but I want to also say that as I propose a kind of a cent an Asian centering of our discourse on religion is that that does not exclude um, Western conceptions and Western practices because we have to remember that Western civilization, secularism, and science are now deeply part of the Asian cultural DNA. And so, and they can no longer be extracted uh, from any Asian culture, I believe. Um, so then what can we do instead? Right, is, um, um, right, I'll get back uh, a little later, but is is a kind of a geological Hello, again, uh, we have lost the audio. Uh, may I suggest, may I suggest that um, Except David Palmer, rest of us, we switch off our video. And all of these are sedimented and actually coexisting, sometimes visible, sometimes invisible. So, however, 
Uh, as we uh, then um, advance towards a, or, or try to find some inspirations uh, to conceive of religion uh, from a, an Asian perspective, we, we need to think of, okay, well, what's the problem though with the modern uh, Western conception of religion? And so basically, um, just in a nutshell, but, and I don't know how that's understood in India, for example, but um, in, um, you know, uh, in, this, in the Western secular uh, context, well, basically religious people, they believe in something, they believe in God, but the, the focus is really on belief here. So you believe in this thing that is not rational. Um, so there's this, this, uh, there's this distinction between belief on the one hand and rationality on the other hand. And so for engaging in, in the study of religion, the academic study of religion, for example, basically we stand on the side of the rational people who are studying these other people uh, who, are, who have these beliefs and we might respect them, but these beliefs are non-empirical and non-rational. And so there's, uh, there's this distinction between belief and rationality and actually a, a division of humanity into two categories of people, the religious people who believe in things and the rational people who don't need to believe in things. Uh, so this is the first uh, kind of distinction. But then also there's the idea that if you believe in one thing, well, then that by definition means that you don't believe in other things. So the belief in this entails the non-belief in that. Um, So an exclusive kind of binary uh, understanding of what belief actually entails. And then another really important point is what I would say is the, the notion of affirmed belief versus embodied belief. So this is very interesting. Uh, and actually, uh, I'll just uh, share a story to explain this idea. Uh, I have a friend um, uh, who used to live in Hong Kong. Uh, she's American. She married... Uh, a Hong Kong Chinese man. And um, well, they had uh, had a courtship, you know, for a very long time. And, um, uh, and so um, my American friend, she, uh, she proposed uh, to the, uh, to the Chinese man um, that, uh, you know, why don't we get married? And he agreed. But he said, on one condition, I will never say, I love you. Now from a Western and actually from a modern romantic perspective, this might seem to be very shocking, but actually what I noticed as I, um, uh, as I observed this couple, and actually my American friend is a member of my religious community, she's a Baha'i and her husband was not. And what I saw is that he accompanied her to all activities he was a real, real gentleman. And in his acts, in his care for her, I saw what is absolutely and truly genuine love. So for him, and this is actually a part of maybe traditional Chinese culture, and I don't know what it would be in Indian culture, for example, what really matters is the act, what you do, and it's not the verbal expression. So from his perspective, and I've heard other people say the saying, you say, I love you, that doesn't really mean anything. What really matters is what you're actually doing. But we have this in the modern conception of religion, though is really what, what actually really counts as the affirmed belief. You say something, you say, I believe in this, I'm a member of this religion. So I had, a, once I had some students uh, and I, they had to do some field research on some kind of religious practice or some kind of cultural practice in Hong Kong. And one uh, pair of students, they, they researched um, people who practice uh, Tai Chi exercises in the morning in the parks in Hong Kong. And uh, there were some videos of uh, the students made some videos and they interviewed and they were very, very good practitioners of these Tai Chi gymnastics. But um, they asked uh, the Taiji practitioner, so do you believe in, are, are you religious? Do you believe in a religion? And they said, no, 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 no. But actually I would say, well, they don't say they're religious and maybe they don't, they don't affirm they're religious, but this Taiji movement is actually a full embodiment of the Taoist cosmology. So in their act, in their embodiment, 
they are absolutely Taoist, even though they make no claim, no affirmed claim to be Taoist. So, but in our in the secular Western understanding of religion, what matters really the most is the affirmation. And then the idea then is that social identities and groups are based on affirmed belief. So we have the group of those who claim to be this religion, and by claiming to be this religion, then they are distinct and opposed to those who claim to be the other religion. So these are some, and I, I, we don't have time to go into um, uh, more uh, depth on, on, on these issues, but this is, uh, these, this is some, uh, some aspects of the modern Western conception of religion that I think uh, are deserving of a critique. And another aspect is what I would call the Westphalian religion. So basically ever since the Treaty of Westphalia in, in, uh, in uh, 1648, emerged the, the notion of an international order where there are a single sovereignty over a well-defined territory. So within a certain very clearly defined line of territorial bounds, there is only one sovereign authority. So then we end up with all these nation states, each with their own flag, for example. But another aspect of the Westphalian um, conception is that each Westphalian state has its religion. So one nation has one religion, one majority religion, and then it might have minority religions. But this is very clear for this is, very, and this is very important for the construction of a Westphalian nation state. So the state needs to construct itself with its clear boundaries, with its own culture, with its boundaries and with its religion. And those, all of these need to map onto that very um, distinct and exclusive boundary. So as I proposed, and in many ways similar to um, uh, uh, Professor Suba, is a sedimented approach uh, to Asian culture, religion, society, or a geological approach where we have all these layers. And often you can't really see, you see one layer of rock and you don't really see that underneath that there's another layer. And that's also a really, really important foundation. And under that layer, there's another layer. And under that layer, there's another layer. But sometimes there are these core, these folds in the rock and these other layers erupt and become visible. Um, so in China, we have the visible layer, which is the communist, the socialist, which is atheist. But then under that, we have the, con the Confucian layer. And then under that, we have the Taoist layer. And then under that, we have the animist layer. And so there are so many layers and the more you explore and the more you dig, then the more you will find out that that first layer that you see uh, may only be a very superficial one. Um, and it is misleading, perhaps. So, uh, and um, uh, when we are living within this society, uh, in fact, all of those layers, we embody all of those layers within our own lives. So we may claim to be one thing, but all of these other things, the other layers are there. They are consciously or unconsciously in our minds and in our bodies. And they, they still, they influence the way that we act and live our lives. So then what might be some other ways of thinking about religion if we delve into the Asian traditions? So, right, well, we have the Indian and I think I can learn far more from you. You know, the notion of, uh, so what's, you know, we talk about the dhar uh, dharma, right? The principles that sustain the world and also by which we lead our lives. And I know that this concept is so deep and I'm not doing justice <laughs> to it <laughs> just in this few sentences. So my apologies right away. But what's very interesting, and this is in a sense where I take the notion of Asian religion as method, is that in Chinese, the Dharma is translated as fa, and fa means, met means method. So it's actually a way of doing things, a method for living your life. Now, of course, then in Chinese, we have the notion of Tao, right? So a way, a path. So what's a path for living our lives? What's a path for building our societies? We also have the notion of li su, rights and customs which is somewhat as, uh, might have some equivalencies with the notion of adat, which exists in Malaysia and Indonesia, the notion of customary norms, rules, and interdictions. In Chinese, we have the notion of teaching. So we have the three teachings, Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. And what's interesting is just like you can study different disciplines at school, you can take uh, psychology and mathematics. You can also take Confucianism and Taoism and Buddhism you can take these different teachings at the same time. You can practice them together in your life. In Islam, we have the notion of deen, the way of life to follow in submission to God. Agama, 
which actually I believe is an Indian, uh, uh, an Indian term originally and still widely used in Malaysia and Indonesia, rites and worship based on sacred texts. And actually what's interesting, if we go to the pre-modern West, then we have the note, what does religion actually mean in the pre-modern West? And it's, it's a bit different from what we understand today. For example, in medieval English, religion was life under monastic vows. And that came from the old French, which means piety and devotion. So religion in this context means piety and devotion. And it comes from the Latin religare, to bind, referring to the bond between humans and gods. But it also means an inner, an inner spiritual disposition, conscientiousness, the sense of rights and moral obligation. So then what I want to do here is by presenting these different conceptions and they're not really, they somewhat overlap and they're somewhat different, but it's to in a sense blast open the notion of religion, to see that there's so many different ways that we can approach. And, and in a sense, many of these different conceptions um, can lead us to different ways of comparing, different ways of finding new insights. What if we compare the agamat of different societies? What if we compare the Tao, the ways of different societies? the methods of different societies, the dharmas of different societies and cultures. So let's, let's think about that. And really though, no matter what, whether we're looking at Dharma Din, devotion or Tao, at the end of it, underlying it all is how to connect to the one or how to be one. And here is something that, there's something that um, in Asian, uh, in the Asian religious traditions then, is something that where there's been deep reflections and um, thought and practices, which is really the how to, uh, which is the notion of non-dualism, how to transcend the dualism, which is inherent in the way that we experience our lives in this world, um, and how to move into a non-dualistic, into into oneness, into oneness with the cosmos, with God, um, with the world. And so, of course, we have this extremely rich, uh, so many different. Uh, ex exquisitely rich traditions in the different Asian religious traditions, uh, which engage with the notion and the, and the dynamic between dualism and non-dualism and oneness and so on. These are very rich conceptually, and they're also very rich in the practice of the individual life. So how can we start thinking about now what might be a practical non-dualism in a sense? How can we be non-dualistic without actually uh, retreating into a cave, or if we have retreated into the cave, and we'll get that, I'll get to that in a few minutes. You know, if we step out of the cave back into this society, how can we bring a non dualism into our real life where we actually have highly dualistic divisions between ourselves and others, uh, between different groups? So, what might be a practical non dualism? So, this is a question I'm off nowadays, I'm really asking myself. So, how can we use a non dualistic? How can some of these rich intellectual spiritual resources of non-dualism help us to learn how to play the game together? So now then, right, seeing then in, in these different forms of uh, non-dualism, um, different modes of relating. How do we relate to what exists in the world? Actually, what is what things is the world made of? And how can we relate to these things? Now, in our intellectual training, in our Western style intellectual training, we tend to see the world as made of objects. Uh, we objectify things. We objectify things and separate them from us. And so it's through objectification that we learn how to know about the world. Even in religious studies and the academic field of religious studies, we objectify a religious group or religious community. And then we learn how to describe it as an external entity. So we tend to treat everything as objects, even people. We treat human beings as objects. We, we objectify first, we objectify them analytically, methodologically. And then after having done that, we have a tendency to objectify them in our practice. So that's one way of, of dealing, of relating with the world is by objectifying. But another one is through treating beings as persons. And so we can see, and I think, um, you know, not what happens when we treat not only human beings as persons, but what happens when we treat non-humans as persons? And actually, this is a question that anthropology uh, in recent years has really been developing or, or been ex uh, inquiring a lot. What happens when we treat uh, mountains as persons? Um, uh, when we treat trees as persons? What does it mean to treat a, to treat a tree, a mountain, a rock, um, an invisible force as persons? So this is one way of relating. Or what about if we start 
um, treating, what if we treat the beings or the entities in the universe as energies? And something that we see a lot in, in actually both Indian and Chinese cosmologies. Well, what does that entail? What if we treat all of these beings as spirits? What if we treat them all as agglomerations, temporary, temporary comings together of different elements that, that will dissolve? What if we treat all of these things as mental images? And so all of these in both in the, in the, in the popular culture or in the highly developed intellectual and religious traditions, we have a lot of, um, a lot of conceptualizations and a lot of practices uh, related to these different ways of relating to the beings in the world. Now, if we treat religion as a question of belief, then maybe when you see this list, you might say, ah, yeah, I, I agree with uh, number one, or I agree with number, you know, uh, number three here, uh, energies, you know, you pick and choose. This is the one I believe in, that's no, I don't believe in that. But if we take Asian religion as method, then maybe we might see it differently. It's not a question of well, what do you agree with or what do you believe and what do you not believe, but what's the method to start to understand, to relate to the world in that way? How can we experience relating to a being as a person? How can we experience relating to a being as energies? How can we experience relating to a being as a mental image or as an agglomeration or as an illusion? So before making judgments, how about if we uh, learn the methods of different methods of relating to the beings that constitute our world? And so if we do that, so if we're doing that, what, what would be the method of doing that? Um, and what would be the implications? What would be the implications of treating beings as objects, of treating them as, of treating them as persons or as energies, as spirits or agglomerations, illusions, mental image? What are the implications for the way that we play our game together, for the way we learn how to live our lives together? So I'm not suggesting that we should simply, oh yes, um, you know, we need to treat all beings in this way or that way, but let's explore that and let's explore the implications of, of different modes of relating. Another thing is another uh, aspect that we can find in Asian religions is thinking with the body. And certainly this is very something that I've studied a lot in China, in Chinese uh, practices. And I know that in India, it's also highly developed. Well, what does it mean to actually think with the whole body in our, um, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the, in the intellectual or Western intellectual tradition that we're, that we're all trained in. In fact, we, we learn to think in a disembodied manner. Um, in a sense, we learn to think in a kind of an empty space where we have different points in what's a straight line, a straight logical or intellectual line from one to the other, where we have the law of contradiction, where if something is A, it cannot be B. But our body doesn't function that way. One part of our body, um, one part of my body is operating in one direction, another part of my body is operating in a different direction, doing different things, and yet it's coordinated. So what does it mean to actually think with the body? When we learn methods to think with the whole body, well, what does that mean? What are the implications of that? Or what about actually to think completely outside the body, which we also find, for example, in many Buddhist, um, uh, Hindu, uh, actually, again, um, uh, and even uh, Christian uh, traditions, you know, what does it, what are the implications to, to actually completely detach ourselves from our body? So in a sense, to objectify our body or to take it as separate from ourselves. So it's very interesting. We can either think in the body, think through the body or think outside the body. What are the implications of thinking this, these different ways? And what does it mean to think with the landscape? Again, the way we're trained to think is one in which, right, we're thinking in an abstract, in an abstract mental space. But what about what happens when our mental op our our um, right our mental um, operation uh, takes place in relation to the landscape that surrounds us? When we are inspired or we're led to to think in a certain way um, by the features of the landscape that surround us, and this is what brings us to the mountains, thinking. So I wanted to think about or talk about thinking up and down the mountains. Um, and actually our, um, our introductory um, words, the beautiful introductory words uh, by Brother Dakar uh, very much uh, illustrated my point um, that 
uh, rising up, rising up to walking and climbing a mountain is also a way of thinking, even if we're not physically climbing the mountain, but the mountain it said, the mountain itself leads our mind upward. It leads the, the image of the mountain leads our mind to come closer to heaven. So in a place like Shilong, uh, in places like Darjeeling, in the Himalayas. So we have valleys, we have rivers and gurgling brooks, we have springs with water gushing out, we have caves, we have high peaks and mountains, we have journeys um, to cover on foot, and all of these different features of our environment can guide and can lead our minds to think along with the landscape, to think into the deep mysteries by entering, by mentally or physically entering the cave, to enter a mode of nurturing when we consider the valley and the community that is, that is living together in the valley, to think of purity for our minds to be purified by thinking of or living, or living close to a, a gushing spring of fresh water and to ascend in a difficult, challenging um, ascent as we climb the mountains and come into a more rarefied atmosphere closer and closer to the divine. So here's where I come to the notion of uh, zomia. Um, now, uh, zomia, is actually uh, what the anthropologist uh, James Scott and taking, uh, who was himself drawing on the work of uh, Van Schendel, um, he used this term to describe the mountainous region, um, which uh, uh, the, 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 the continental mountainous massif of Southeast Asia, which includes Southwest China, Northeast India, and the mountainous regions of Laos, Thailand, Myanmar, and even down to Malaysia, if one wishes. And according to other, uh, other authors, also extending to the Himalayan regions of New uh, Bhutan, Nepal, uh, Southern Tibet, and even into Afghanistan for some authors as well. And so this whole region, this region which has been called Zomia, um, in James Scott's formulation, it has some special characteristics. So these are regions which, um, in a sense, they are populated by different peoples who have either voluntarily or forcefully, they've fled the lowlands. They've fled the rice cultivating lowlands and the empires of the lowlands. So whether it's the Chinese empires uh, of the Yangtze and Yellow Rivers, uh, whether it's the, uh, the empires of, which are now in, in Southern Thailand or Southern Burma, or whether it's also the, the kingdoms of India. And so uh, in, the, in this space, this mountainous rugged space in between of all these empires, there are all these incredibly differentiated um, populations, these incredibly differentiated tribes, um, uh, um, uh, social groups, uh, which have unbelievably, it's, all, it's impossible to even identify in a very stable and consistent way what ethnic group they belong to. There are so many changes and transformations. There's so much, dis, so much uh, diversity. And, um, and for James Scott, for many of these groups, they've actually voluntarily, they are not primitive vestiges of some ancient times. They may be um, people who have voluntarily, even not so long ago, maybe only a few hundred years ago, who have left the lowlands and settled up in the mountains uh, to stay away from the taxation uh, and from the burdens of civilization. And these places are isolated. They're up in the valleys, up in the mountains. And yet, and so this isolation makes them highly differentiated from one another, but they're also deeply connected there are so many trade routes, so many circulations. And so the connections between the highlands and the lowlands are also quite deep. And so this Zomi is a land of high differentiation, high diversity, but it's all, and a land of people who want to be away from the lowlands, but it's also a space of connection, a, a space of connection between the high and the low. And I wanna think about this also in terms of, um, 
in, in spiritual uh, in, in, in spiritual um, in spiritual terms, the highlands are often conceived of, and often by the lowland people. They're conceived of as a place where you, right, you go up into the mountains for a spiritual cultivation. You go into the caves to become a hermit. It's in these mountains among these tribes that you have those who know the magic, who have powerful spirituality. The lowlands, by contrast, are considered to be the places where the people are cunning, uh, where they've been corrupted by civilization. And yet they're also important because that's where we have order, where we have um, where we ha have high levels of social development and organization. So in a sense, there's a complementary relationship between the highlands and the lowlands. This makes me think of the Chinese notion of tian di ren, of heaven, earth, and humans. So as humans, we live between the earth, which is the lowlands, and heaven, which is up in heaven. And we live in between that. And that's what it is to be human. It's not to be completely spiritual, nor to be completely material, but it's to be in that in-between space. And so in a sense, Zomia, these highlands of the uh, Northeast India, Southwest China, the Northern Southeast Asia, and the Himalayan regions, these are regions where human beings, they ascend into, they leave the highland, they leave the lowlands, they go and ascend uh, closer to heaven. Um, they acquire some distance uh, from that materialistic lowland. And so they reach up to the heavens. But then I want to ask the question, so we, we gain some insights. Um, we engage in these practices in the rarefied atmosphere of the mountains, coming close to the heavens, but then we'll come back down. And so what will we bring to the earth below, to the world below when we come back down? Well, there's one thing that I think that we can bring if we consider the region of Zomia, it's a region that is in between these great civilizations and empires. It's in between China and India and these other agrarian civilizations of Southeast Asia. But when you ascend the mountain, high up on the mountain, and then you look around 360 degrees, you've transcended those divisions. And you found yourself in the pivot, in the pivot around which all of these civilizations are located. So how can we bring those insights from being up there in the mountains? How can we bring those insights back down to the world below? And so this is what I would invite us all to think about. How can we think up and down the mountains? And as we do though, and as we do that, how can we imagine, how can we experiment with, how can we find methods for different modes of rela relating? How can we gain insights from other conceptions of religion? How can we engage in an inter-Asian dialogue, inter-Asian approaches? And how can all of these insights, how can all these methods allow us to learn new ways of playing the game, which will be relevant to the present moment? Thank you very much.